Hello, everybody. In class, we talked about um, what happens to the graph that represents the uh, depth or height of the water level over time when we fill certain con different containers with, uh, with water at a constant rate. In this case, we observed that uh, if a container um, has uniform width, then we are going to see what we call a constant rate of change, which manifests itself as a uh, line. And uh, if we see the, uh, the glass getting wider, then what we see is a curve, because basically the depth is going to increase very quickly at the earlier stage and very slowly as the glass or the container gets wider. Um, so this is going to be the basis for what we're going to be studying in this chapter called the average rate of change, but uh, we'll just look at a couple more things here. Um, so... Again, what we see uh, is if we have a uniform width, we're going to see a constant rate of change, so we're going to see linear graphs. Then when we see a very wide base, that's going to create a very slow increase, which manifests itself as a sort of not as very steep, not very steep line. Here, on the other hand, the depth is going to increase very quickly, and therefore the line gets steeper. And this is what we're going to talk about. Um, so just flash forward here, this is another container, it looks more like a dumbbell or something, um, and here's a graph that represents the depth over time. And um, what I'd like to do is make an observation about what we understand without even knowing it, that we understand it. And that is, when the graph is really steep, that means that the depth is increasing quickly, so it's fast. And when the graph is not very steep, it means that the graph, or the, sorry, the depth is increasing slowly, not very fast. But, of course, with math, we manage to quantify or put number to anything. So we can actually find a way to represent speed, not just as how steep the graph is, but as a number. So if we look at this particular image, we have this set of boxes. This is about four boxes representing the change in D, the first change in depth. And here represents the change in time. So we can actually compare the change in depth over time as a ratio. We call that change in depth over change in time. And when we make that ratio, it's going to become a number. Here's a different depth, and here is a longer amount of time. If we take the D2, change in D2, and divide it by in a ratio, the change, or compare it in a ratio to the change in T2, you're going to get another number. The question is, which one of these ratios would give a larger number? If you're thinking that D, change in D1 over change in T1 is going to be the larger number, you are correct. And we can see it here because we have more depth over less time. That's why the graph is steep, because we are going very fast. We're covering a lot of ground in a very short period of time. So what we get then is large numbered ratios correspond to steep parts of the graph. Smaller numbered ratios correspond to flatter parts of the graph. So this idea that we can turn a speed into a, or express a speed as a ratio is what we're going to be practicing for the next week or so. So here are the nuts and bolts. We have this concept called average rate of change, and it's nothing more than a ratio. All we're doing is comparing how a dependent variable changes over the amount of uh, time or independent variable changes. So common change rates that you probably already realize um, you know are miles per hour, miles per gallon, and then there's pounds per square inch if you ever fill up a tire with air. Pounds per square inch um, is the way that they measure pressure on the tire. These are common rates. Um, so for example, if you get 30 miles per gallon, that means that every gallon of gas that you consume, your vehicle can travel 30 miles. So 30 miles for every one gallon driven. So we're used to or accustomed to talking about rates in everyday culture. Um, but again, what we're going to do is learn how to connect the graphical interpretation of rate of change to the numerical ratio that's rate of change and uh, try to understand how this is a useful concept. So, in order to calculate rate of change, these are the steps that you need to follow. First, you need to identify two points along the course of a function. So, if you have any two points in time, you can uh, calculate an average change rate um, between the points in time. 
Then you determine how much the y variable has changed. We call that change in y. We use the triangle to represent change. Then you figure out how much the x variable has changed, and you call that change in x, and you simply put them together in a ratio. Nothing more to it than that. So as an example, here we have a function which is representing the uh, time in seconds and then the height in feet of an arrow. So this is an arrow, um, I believe, just making sure. Um, yeah, well, it, I guess it didn't say, but uh, yeah, we, well, this, I refer to this quite a lot in this particular chapter. This is an arrow that's being shot straight up in the air. Hopefully this person, uh, by nine seconds, has gotten out of the way before the arrow hits them again. Anyway, um, we can see then that as seconds pass, the height of the arrow is going to change. It seems to be going up for a little while, but then the arrow starts to descend. So that's just basically what's going on. Um, what we're supposed to do is determine the average rate of change as time goes from one to seven seconds. So in other words, one second after the arrow was shot, the arrow seemed to increase, and then just around six seconds or five seconds, it started to fall down again, and seven seconds later, it was at 290 feet up in the air. So the question is, on average, how fast was the arrow traveling in that amount of time? So, just like uh, was shown on the previous slide, the first thing we need to do is identify two points from the graph equation or table. Here I have two points, one for one second and one for seven seconds. Um, next thing, determine how much the y has changed, then determine how much the x has changed, and then put them into a ratio and simplify. So here's how we start. I always write change in y over change in x. And then I show the height at seven seconds, subtract the height at one second. The question I have for the class is, why do we subtract? What is, how does subtraction show the change? So think about that. Why are we subtracting to figure out the change and why? Anyway, um, I would like you to practice uh, using this particular notation as you do your work. That is, you start with the change in y over change in x, and then you show h of 7 minus h of 1 over 7 minus 1. In other words, if we're going over from 1 to 7 seconds, we will see the 7s and the 1s lined up accordingly. From the table, I can see that um, h of 1 is um, 158 feet, and h of 7 is 290 feet. See that right here. So I, re I substitute h of 7 for its actual value, the height at 1 second for its actual value, and then I subtract. Now what you can see is this ratio in context says that the arrow went 132 feet over a 6 second span. That's 132 feet every 6 seconds. If you take this ratio and divide it out, it becomes the number 22. But the labels stay. Feet, 132 feet over 6 seconds, simplifies to 22 feet per second. So 132 feet every 6 seconds averages out to 22 feet for every 1 second. All right, so make sure that we uh, include our labels in our response and, of course, a quick statement of understanding. So what this number, 22 feet per second, is telling me is that every second that passed from 1 second to 7 seconds, the height increased an average of 22 feet. So um, when you make your statement of understanding, try to avoid saying 22 feet per second. Tell me what 22 feet per second actually means. All right, so quick summary. Every time, every time, every time you are asked to um, calculate average rate of change, always use change in y over change in x. I'll tell you why later. Always use your labels whenever we're working with context application problems. Use labels in your answers and use labels as often as you can. When working with context, always include a statement of understanding, something that shows that you know what you mean in context. And finally, support your work graphically whenever possible. We'll talk about that more later as well. Um, but for now, um, I would like everybody to do the work on page 6. Page 6 is one, two, three different functions, one of them dealing with the weight of postage, and one of them dealing with uh, fuel economy, and one of them dealing with population of gray wolves. Um, what I'd like you to do is to calculate average rate of change um, for these and describe what's, what you're getting um, as results in context. So um, use the examples that I said. This is all found in your notes from pages 1 through 6. Um, all of these notes you can see in the examples. Um, study them. And when you get to class, um, you should have the work on page 6 uh, done or mostly done or at least started. So thank you for watching.